It's 2011. I'm deep into my 10th grade now like other girls emo punk rock era. After school, I go through a list of series with boys who make deals with demons, loading up episodes of Death Note, Naruto, and Black Butler on my family's desktop. There's something in particular about Black Butler that had me hooked. I was captivated by the fashion, gore, and of course the devilishly handsome butler, Sebastian, whose red-eyed gaze released puberty-coated feelings in my deeply Catholic teenage soul. Like the Bible literally warned me that the devil would try to seduce me, and here I was, seduced. My young ripe soul was still new to the world of not only demons, but of anime, and therefore completely unaware of the effect it would later have on me as an adult. When over a decade later, I would re-watch the series and discover that this anime was hiding one hell of a messy secret. Welcome anime friends, if you're new here, hi, my name is Phoenix. Today, we'll be exploring the absolute insanity of Kuroshi Tsuji, aka Black Butler, its chaotic anime adaptation, and addressing the creator's past work. This video will be diving into some pretty dark topics, including gore, horror, and some explicit topics, so please proceed with caution. However, I will be censoring a lot of it to appease the YouTube algorithm. I'll also be avoiding any major spoilers for this series for those who have not watched the series yet and still want to get into it. Before we begin though, there's one rule you must follow. Make sure to grab your cup and guard your souls because today we're going to be diving into the Black Butler anime tea. Let's begin. Black Butler fit right in with all the other supernatural dark anime coming out in the mid to late 2000s, including even American TV shows at the time. Supernatural, the TV show, started running in 2005 and quickly gained a cult-like following, so much so that it ran until 2020 which is insane. Bella and Edward entered a one-sided staring contest in 2008's Twilight, and Vampire Love Triangles blossomed in the Vampire Diaries in 2009. And anime shows like Death Note would premiere on Adult Swim in 2007, introducing young American fans who stayed up past their bedtimes to the world of edgy, morally gray protagonists for the new era. Fairly different from the boisterous, lovable MCs they were used to seeing in the still mostly kid-friendly Toonami at the time, leaning into gothic fashion with characters like Mina and turning terrifying Shinigamis like Ryuk into mostly lovable sidekicks who could care less if you lived, died, or unalived other people. But my search for more edgy, morally gray protagonists led me to Black Butler. For the uninitiated into the world of demon butlers, Black Butler follows CL Phantom Hive, a young heir to a wealthy toy company and loyal guard dog to the Queen of England. After the murder of his parents and his own abuse at the hands of an unknown group, CL enters into a deal with the demon, Sebastian Michaelis, to help exact his revenge on those who have wronged him. In order to carry out his demands, Sebastian takes on the form of CL's butler, hence the title, with his end goal of devouring CL's soul. Somehow a single series was able to combine a murder mystery, a revenge plot, a hot demon butler, and intricate victory era fashion all into one series. Black Butler characters honestly have some of the most in-depth character analysis I've ever seen for an anime, but I will only be getting into the two main characters for this section, starting with, of course, CL Phantom Hive. The bratty little rich kid you hate to root for, who also has the ability to model incredible fashion better than most runway models. CL's character is essentially a popular trope known as the boy Lolita, a young boy who is pretty and effeminate looking and dresses in gothic fashion. Clothing fits the era of the story it's set in, consisting of trailing skirts, cloaks, corsets, and other intricate designs for the male and female characters, and it's a running joke in the show to dress CL specifically up as a woman. We want to know more about Bishonen, their looks, and why it's popular in anime. I actually made a video on that that you can watch up here. But ultimately, CL is just a really conniving, wealthy young boy with a dark view of the world that came from all of the tragic events that he had to witness. Parents brutally unalived and house burned down, kidnapped and abused by the hands of an unknown group he wants to get revenge against. You know, the usual recipe for young angsty characters who are seeking violence. What I appreciate about CL's character, despite him being way too intelligent and emotionally dead inside at his age, is he actually does have valid reasons for acting the way he does. He is not the good guy by any means, nor does he want to be, and yet you find yourself selfishly rooting for his bloodthirsty revenge when you see what the people who took everything from him are actually capable of. Next up is CL's right-hand demon man, Sebastian Michaelis. Besides being a very sexy demon butler, who all the girls both in the series itself and in Black Butler's audience pine after, including my hormonal teenage self many years ago, the man is ultimately just a hungry devil trying to craft the perfect meal. A soul lost to deception, cruelty, and revenge, aka CL's soul. Despite being the technical villain of the series, I mean his existence is literally to be the downfall of the main character, CL, since his goal is to devour CL's soul at the end. But despite that, he's also the most overpowered character and is the comedic relief of the series. 
I mean, the guy literally fights people with cutlery. Like, imagine walking up to somebody and they just pull out a butter knife and a fork and then, you know, whip your ass. I mean, that's basically Sebastian in a, in a nutshell. He's also obsessed with black kittens, which is kind of adorable for a demon. But first, we need to talk about the absolute insanity, the mess of an anime adaptation that is Black Butler. This is because of what I can only refer to as Black Butler's open wound. The anime original adaptation of most of season one and the entirety of season two and the chaos that followed. It's pretty important to understand why fans are so upset with the first few seasons of the anime and why it's made itself so difficult for new fans to try to get into. Which on a side note, I need to gripe about how complex it is to watch the series uh, because of licensing issues. For example, seasons one and two are available on Hulu. Seasons one through three are available on Funimation, which would be okay except that Funimation is supposed to be disappearing because it's turning into just Crunchyroll. So a lot of people, you know, have canceled their subscriptions to Funimation so that they can watch all the series on Crunchyroll, but Crunchyroll does not have seasons one through three of Black Butler, even though they are getting the fourth season set to come out in 2024. I made this infographic so you can find the series without having to hunt for it like a bloodthirsty demon like I did and make your life easier. The main culprit for the series downfall is beyond just accessibility though. Like most series that came out in the 2000s, fans should be familiar with a concept known as filler. It is the substance that fills the proverbial lips of many an anime, especially ones that premiered before their manga finished or ones that were coming out in between their manga publishing, which is the case for Black Butler. There's actually a great clip explaining why like filler exists and uh, what its purpose is for that I'll show a little bit of on here. But a simple explanation is basically just original content made for a series that is not in the original material or canon that a series is based off of. In this case, Black Butler was adapted from a manga that updated essentially a month between new chapters and is still currently ongoing at that same pace. At the time of its September 2008 anime release, the manga itself only had about 19 chapters available, which may seem like enough for a full season of anime, at least if it was 12 episodes or less. However, Black Butler had a 24 episode run for its first season. And since some parts of those 19 chapters were not really all plot based and some were just slice of life moments that happened between the characters, the series took the moments with plot and ran with it ran with it all the way through season two and a little bit beyond. People thought that the Promise Neverland season two original anime was bad. It has nothing on the unnecessary complexity of Black Butler's season one and two. This unnecessary complicated way of adapting the series ended up turning Black Butler season one and two into more of a multi-choice visual novel game with multiple bad endings and fans searching for the true ending that led them to the canon events that happened in the manga. In the first season, there are canonically only a couple of episodes that were adapted from the manga, including episodes one through six and 13 through 15, which cover the Black Butler arc, the Red Butler arc, and the Indian Butler arc, which covers Sebastian and Ciel's introduction, Grell Sutcliffe and Madame Red's introduction and Shoma and Agni's introduction to the series. While every other part of this season is anime original filler, meaning the entire middle and ending of the season was completely made up and completely goes left of what happens in the manga and ended up creating a narrative that Ciel and Sebastian's storylines basically ended like completely, like irrevocably, or at least created one ending to the story. I personally think that season one did a decent job of setting up the characters, the world, and kind of getting us adapted to this Victorian era uh, revenge story, including the manga's signature style and dark comedy thrown in. But as the seasons continue and the manga arcs progress, you really can only look back on season one with a bit of disappointment, wondering what a fully fleshed out canon adaptation would have looked like. Black Butler could have had a one season insane introduction to the series that brought fans to the manga and could have mostly still kept everyone happy. But since the series was too popular for its own good, it got renewed for a second season in 2010. And you know, since it was a second season, it had to connect somehow to the first. 
Season 2 introduces two new characters, Alois, another wealthy child left to care for an entire estate on his own, and Claude, his demon butler. Sound familiar? Well, it's exactly the same setup as Season 1, with completely anime original characters. At first, you think the entire second season will be about these two new characters based on the finale of Season 1, but surprisingly, characters from Season 1 end up making a reappearance. Some in a way that greatly contradict the events that happened in the first season. Black Butler Season 2 really said fuck continuity and kept it pushing. Now about Season 2's characters. Alois and Ciel are two different characters, and so is Claude and Sebastian. They just share similar situations. Where I tolerate Ciel because his bratty behavior at least has some level of maturity, I absolutely loathe Alois. They gave him this bratty, mischievous child character trope, which I can't really describe, so just, you know, watch this scene and make of it what you will. Despite him actually acting like a child, which would be, you know, refreshing because, you know, anime kids never act like children, but I digress. There is a certain undertone with his character that is shown in relationship to other characters that literally gives me goosebumps and grosses me out. Hey, it's Editing Phoenix here. Before Alois and Season 2 Black Butler fans come for me, I have to admit I got a little personal in my description of Alois because I don't really like his character, but I also want to address that Alois is really important to a lot of Black Butler fans, and I understand why. It's also important to note that his character has gone through many traumatic experiences, like being sexually exploited by characters in the series, and there are times when he uses his sexuality to regain power for himself against those who have wronged him. So I advise caution in watching season two for Alois and the context behind him uh, and also how it's handled, which is not great. But again, this is a show for escapism and I'll get into that later. But Alois and Claude do serve a purpose in their seasons and they are important characters to their seasons. Uh, but their story is more of an addition to the series rather than a main part of the storyline. Like, they don't really need to exist for the storyline, but they're kind of like something extra that a lot of fans ended up liking, except for me. So, please watch it and come to your own conclusions, but be aware of the not-so-great aspects about it that you should be aware of. Okay, back to the video. And following the footsteps of the first season, season two decided to have a permanent irrevocable final ending, this time seeming to seal the show off for good. And then in 2014, the series got another continuation announcement, completely ignoring the previous two bad endings and going back to the manga to continue the actual canon events of the story. Especially since season three would focus on the Book of Circus or the Circus Arc, a fan favorite of the manga, but one that didn't really connect to season two at all. Watching season three alone made me realize why watching the canon order based on this Reddit post is the ideal way to go for any anime watcher of the series. Book of Circus is probably the second best animated and directed part of the series in my personal opinion. It further dives into CL's character and his backstory in a way that season one and two never could or, or really did a good job of, and also introduces a colorful cast of circus characters you get to know throughout the season. All the while, CL has to go on behalf of the queen to try to determine what secrets that these characters could be hiding. And of course, Sebastian is teasing CL in the background. On a side note, the fashion in the Book of Circus arc is the best, honestly, of, uh, of all the anime, personally. And it's even more intricate and elaborate in the manga, hence why it takes Tabasa so long to put out a chapter of manga. I mean, just look at this art from the Circus arc of the manga incredible. This arc also brings Ciel closer to the people who may have been responsible for his parents' deaths and for his own abuse and mistreatment as a kid, making for an overall very entertaining season, a shining light in the dark chaos of an anime adaptation. And honestly, if you wanted, you could kind of skip season one and two a little bit um, and just read a bit of the manga and then go into season three by itself. But the best part of season three is that it doesn't end with an anime original ending, it actually leaves room for fans to learn more about the story and continue on the story in the anime and hopefully find the true ending. Instead of another season, the next portion of the story, the Phantom Hive Manor Murder arc, or Book of Murder, was adapted into a two-part OVA. If you're unfamiliar, an OVA, or original video animation, is usually an unaired longer episode that can be filler or canon. 
Sometimes they get sold separately or with a set of a manga volume or with a DVD of the anime series, but they're usually never put on licensing services in the US at least because they're meant to be like exclusive extra content. Even if in this case it is technically canon and part of the series and kind of goes along with the main story of the manga, so therefore you may want to watch it. It luckily though isn't really that important for the series itself. You could probably skip most of it and be okay. But for those curious to know what it's about, Book of Murder is basically a whodunit murder mystery that starts with the guests of the Queens visiting the Phantom Hive Manor, who CL entertains by throwing a party, inviting prominent figures, including a real life famous author that CL and Sebastian quote unquote end up inspiring. The Queen's guest ends up murdered on the first night, and the rest of the days were spent trying to determine the killer as more deaths occur. Finally, we get to my favorite animated portion of the series, arguably the best of all the adaptations so far, the Luxury Liner arc, aka Book of the Atlantic. The Luxury Liner arc may at first seem like a mixture of the Titanic and Scooby-Doo Zombie Island mixed together, but in actuality it has several surprising moments that make it a joy to watch. Shout out specifically to Lizzie's character in the Book of Atlantic movie, because up until this point I thought Lizzie was just a side character that didn't really have much to do with the story besides being a damsel in distress and like the one thing that like ties CL to his humanity, but in actuality she's a much more interesting character than first let on. Also another secretive character makes a grand appearance in the movie, but you would do better to not watch the first season or at least the filler parts of the first season in order to be truly surprised by the revelation of this character in the movie. Anyway, this movie is not only incredibly animated, gorgeous, and has fantastic character moments for deserving side characters, but my favorite part of the movie was seeing a flashback of CL and Sebastian after CL made his deal with him. A moment that fleshes out the relationship between the two in a more interesting but also somewhat wholesome way that is kind of surprising since, you know, the main point of Sebastian's character is to devour CL's soul. And again, at the end of this movie, we reach another story continuation, which leads us to the public school arc. In July 2023, it was announced that Black Butler would get another anime continuation with the 2024 release of season four. This time under a different studio, Cloverworks, which is responsible for shows like Spy Family, Bochy the Rock, Shadow House, and dropping the ball on The Promised Neverland season two. But they did a pretty decent job of season one, so don't blame them just on that. Fans are a little bit uncertain about the change in production, especially fans worried about the look of Sebastian, who takes on a more be seinen or pretty guy aesthetic in the newest trailer. But honestly, debates on Sebastian's looks have been going on since the manga alone was around, because there are times where Tabasso switched between more effeminate looks for Sebastian and more masculine looks. Personally, I love whatever look he had in the Book of Atlantic movie, because look at this screenshot, y'all. That's all I have to say. Beyond our main characters though, fans were introduced to the newest characters that will be introduced in this section. Members of the Hufflepuff, Slytherin, Gryffindor, and Ravenclaw houses. I mean, whoops, okay, wrong franchise. Scarlet Fox, Sapphire Owl, Green Lion, and Violet Wolf houses of the public school that CL will be attending in order to solve another mystery. And if you know anything about Tabasso's other works, you shouldn't be surprised that there's a seemingly random section about a boarding school, particularly an all boys boarding school. Though the anime had a rocky start, starting from Book of Circus to what we have now, fans have been excited more and more for the series to get a continuation and see more from the beloved manga. On top of all the back and forth that the anime received for its messy adaptation, there's one part that may be a bit more particular, but that English fans will be very familiar with, as it left a lasting divide on fans of the series. The English localization, aka the dub. Now the dub versus sub debate has been going on within fandom since the beginning of time. It's fans who prefer sub arguing that it's better for understanding a series as close to the original as possible without having to worry as much about censorship and changes to dialogue just to fit the perspective of the audience in the country that is localizing it. Which is understandable if you grew up watching four kids dubs, but dub watchers argue that, you know, now that localization is getting a little bit better, the range of voice actors has become more diverse, and watching the dub is easier for multitasking. The later is personally why I watch Black Butler 
in English. Now some fans may check out this video just because I said I watched it only in English and um, I understand, but, but if you want to hear me out, the reasoning besides multitasking is also to understand fans' arguments about the credibility of the dub itself. Also, J. Michael Tatum's voice is a bit nostalgic for me, and I personally do like his voice as Sebastian. The main issues with the dub can be summed up into three major issues. The first being a bunch of folks from Texas were told to put on British accents with various degrees of success. Since Funimation's headquarters, the licensing company responsible for dubbing Black Butler in English existed in Texas, lots of the American voice actors were American and de therefore did not have British accents. So it's easy to tell for a majority of the characters that Americans put on British accents, even if you are not British, you can. it's pretty easy to tell. And this isn't something that only afflicts Black Butler. I've seen a few other series that have gotten English dubs where the voice actors are told to put on accents to fit the localization a little bit better. Trying to be authentic with localizing is touch and go depending on the diversity and range in the cast that you have. Speaking of diversity, one concern for the voices of Black Butler are those of Shoma and Agni, who are two Indian characters who are voiced by two white men. So do with that information what you will. The second point is that some phrases get lost in translation, including key phrase that Sebastian says throughout the show that fans are very divided on. Sebastian's signature tagline in English, You see I am simply one hell of a butler. It is a very common line that he says almost in every episode, sometimes more than once. In the Japanese version, however, it has two slight variations that bring more nuance to the saying. Akumada, shitsuji desu kara. Akuma de means being a demon. Made is simply, and akumade combines simply and being a demon. Basically, the Japanese version is much more clever than the English, which causes a tone shift in the saying, and that vexes some of the fans. And the third point, arguably the most important point, and the reason why I think a lot of fans have contentment towards the dub, is the gender and pronouns for an important character that were grossly mishandled. Grell, who is an undeniable fan favorite character, unfortunately faced misgendering in the dub because of Western stereotyping, the English language reliance on pronouns, and the fact that the series was dubbed in the 2000s. When speaking in Japanese, one person can often be referred to by their name rather than their pronouns. All references of Grell's character by other characters is never referred to using male pronouns. But when speaking Japanese, people often refer to themselves using somewhat gendered language. For example, women must own most commonly use atashi or watashi when referring to themselves, whereas men can use boku, ore, or watashi to refer to themselves. I also found this really good article by Cameron Lombardo on Tofugu discussing a queer take on gendered Japanese, which explores the complexity of personal gender pronouns and language in Japanese and how they're used. So if you want a more nuanced way of exploring how gendered language is used in Japanese, check out this article, it'll be listed with all the other articles down below. But in English, pronouns and subjects are necessary parts of sense and structure, meaning in translation for both the manga and the anime and dub and subtitles, there are times when Grell is given he, him pronouns despite referring to herself as a woman. Though they have made strides to adjust this language by the time Book of the Atlantic came about, the damage had already been done. Even beyond the English dub though, there are gripes on the Japanese side as well with the voice actor's portrayal of Grell being unnecessarily over the top, and even furthermore, in the stereotypical way that Grell is written to lust after Sebastian every given moment. Despite how much of a mess the anime adaptation is and the different gripes and things that fans have with it, there's one part of this series that I think a lot of people know about but often gets swept under the rug and something that honestly took me a little bit by surprise when I stumbled upon it in the research of this video. It's something that the anime adaptation does a decent job of keeping hidden, but even then a few telling scenes still peek through. In the first few seasons of Black Butler, you may notice a few random, unnecessary scenes pop up throughout. The first one I noticed in my rewatch was this totally random, uncalled for scene of Sebastian putting CL into a corset. There are several scenes from season one and two and beyond with Sebastian undressing CL, putting on his clothes, bathing him, and similar scenes with that in season two with Aloise and Claude. Moments that, okay, you could possibly write off as a butler just taking care of his lord, but there are extended parts and unnecessary parts that kind of get a little bit too much focus. There's even a random moment in season one where Grell says what everyone is thinking out loud. 
Why does this little kid get all the good looking men? All these scenes on their own are innocuous one off events that don't really add anything to the story and therefore can be often be forgettable or overlooked. Especially when most of your prepubescent attention is set on looking at how hot Sebastian is. But what if I told you that these scenes may be a reference to certain themes that the creator of the series herself once used to make under a different pen name? First, I think it's only right to introduce Yama Tubaso and her works. Before creating Black Butler, she had a single volume series titled Rust Blasters from, that ran from 2005 to 2006 a shonen series about vampire boys who go to a boarding school. She is most probably known as being the creator and mangaka behind Kuro Shitsuji, aka Black Butler, which started running in 2006 and is still running today. She is also the official artist as well as the character concept and scenario designer for Disney's Twisted Wonderland, a game that started in 2020 and continues to go on today. Which on a side note, look at how beautiful these character designs are. If Tapasso can do anything, it's designed in intricate, fashionable bishonen. It's absolutely insane that Disney, or at least a subsidiary of Disney, reached out to Tsubasa to have her basically create this, the concept for this game and series. Considering her primary work, her primary most popular work features freaking demon butlers murdering people. But honestly, Disney seems to have taken the debut on this one because, because Twisted Wonderland is hugely popular in Japan, especially this specific character, just this guy right here. Everyone is in love with him. Tabasso also wears many hats, you know, she's not only making Kuroshitsuji as we speak, working on concept and official art for Twisted Wonderland at any given moment, but she's also a business owner launching her own business titled Black Label, which is a merchandise spin-off of the Black Butler series that has a pop-up store and cafe in, in various major cities in Japan. But a known fact about Yana Tabasso that people tend to overlook despite being well aware of the fact, especially if you've been following her work for a while, is the work that she's done under her alternate pen name, Yanao Rock. Under Yanao Rock, she created two works, Hana Shonen, which ran in 2005, and Glamorous Lip, which ran in 2006, both of which are yaoi anthologies, which are erotic boys love short stories, with many of the short stories also featuring Shotokan. Now, I don't know how much I can explain of this concept without getting demonetized, by YouTube, so I'm going to be censoring a lot of things. A shota, which I will be referring to as an S, is basically a young male character in the similar vein as a loli, which I'll refer to as Ls, which are young or young looking girl characters. This is an area of the anime fandom that gets a lot of deservingly questionable glances thrown its way. If you see someone with these kind of stickers on their car, run especially since L's in particular are very common in even mainstream anime series, but often are seen as harmless because they tend to be in the form of a thousand year old ageless girls who just look young and therefore are fair game for older characters and audiences to objectify and sexualize. On the opposite end of that are S's, who sometimes are ageless, but most commonly are just notably young and are often paired with older characters, male or female. In Tabasa Rock's case, her stories, Hana Shonen and Glamorous Lip contain Escon, Yaoi, meaning young male characters paired up with older male characters in E word situations. Tabasa is not the only creator to ever create this, to ever make this. Despite not being as popular as Elcon, Escon still has its own influence in Dojinchi and like, you know, certain areas of the anime fandom and things like that. And you don't just find these types of characters in the dark web. They're also in licensed, licensed uh, kind of public and well-known content. They show up in popular series that though they don't contain the E word, these types of characters are still considered S's and L's. For example, in Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, it has, re it has references to both S's and L's. Genshin Impact is also full of both, getting some VTubers in trouble for being openly gross about liking that kind of stuff. Even Oran's Honey Senpai sometimes is argued to be an S. Now that we know what an S is, it's fair to say that CL is one. And CL is paired with a demon who is in the form of a grown ass man. And of course, this is the same pairing for season two's original characters, Alois and Claude. The point is elements from Tabasso's past works seem to be slipped into Black Butler as well. If not for a complete shift in demographics, as well as editing and marketing advice from people around her, Black Butler may, be a, may have been a totally different series. 
On one hand, shifting away from gay pairings to appeal to a wider audience is unfortunately telling of the type of censorship that published anime and manga series create, while simultaneously giving a pass to the thousand-year-old L's in the room. I mean, if you look at Yano Tobaso's Rust Blasters in particular, it had all the makings of a classic high school BL, but it didn't get a continuation, possibly because it was published in a shonen manga among with others. But a series about a boy and his talented demon butler did because the appeal was wider, and the shift proved to be very successful, with over 30 million copies sold of the volumes since 2007, and the amount of adaptations the series continues to get even 15 years after its original creation. However, the pairing of the two main characters and their relationship with one another does not go overlooked by fans, which is often how series, especially shonen, tend to get around appealing to their straight women audiences without actually having to be upfront about the sexuality of characters. More on that in this video up here. Thanks to the work of a dedicated fan of Tabasso's work, Naoki, who created a site that provides information on all of Tabasso's BL series under the pen name Yanao Rock, there's more context for her yaoi work before and even during Black Butler. According to Naoki and their site, there are at least five other stories penned by Yanao Rock besides Hana Shonen and Glamorous Lip. Now, I'm not going to get into detail about the context for these works because it is explicit, but I do want to say before you hear the rest of the section that after April 2007, at least a year since starting Kuro Shitsuji, there are no other records of Tabasso making these types of works. This information has left me conflicted and with more questions than answers, especially since I initially wanted to make this video to just provide information, not to expose Tabasso as a possible bad person or make other people think that way. On one hand, we can acknowledge that yes, her past works contain explicit S-Con and that is bad, but does that mean fans who watch or read Black Butler should be condemned for liking Tabasso's newer stories, including Black Butler and or Rust Blasters? My answer to that is I don't believe they should be, especially since many fans openly disdain any insinuation of romance between Ciel and Sebastian or Claude and Eloise and don't interact with Tabasso's works under the name Yanao Rock, not to mention the amount of fans who may not even know about these works in the first place. Is the fact that Tabasso no longer creates these types of series a sign that she's changed and won't make this type of content again? Possibly. I like to think so, and I think other Black Butler fans believe that her works have gotten better at veering away from what she used to create under the pen name Yanao Rock. Now, should fans of Yaoi or any other medium that feature Escon or Elcon be called out? That's more tricky. There are factors to consider before attacking someone's interests, such as age and sexual orientation of that person who is into that content, especially because that can add like, a lot of nuance to it. Um, and there are other things to consider as well. Ultimately, as always, it is up to each of us to determine how to interact with the works we consume and what to do with the information we know. However, I personally do not condone threatening, harassing, or attacking anyone online, especially based on minimal information or assumptions. Uh, so with that, I really don't know how to view Tabasso's works under the pen name Yanao know, Rock. I can only say that I personally disdain anything with minors or depictions of minors in explicit situations. As for you all, all I can do is encourage you. I hate to like make light of the situation uh, and I hope that I'm not by saying this, uh, but it is a complex topic that I think deserves a genuine reflection um, and care when coming to terms with how we feel about it and the works that we watch and what we consume, um, no matter what culture or country that it comes from. We ultimately decide for ourselves what uh, our boundaries are. So do allow yourself time to come to conclusions about the information shared in this video. With that, if you feel there is a better way I could have addressed these topics, please let me know and I will try to do better next time or make adjustments as needed. There's a quote from Tabasso that stuck with me. She says, Every character has their own sense of justice, which is just as true in the real world. It's very important to stand firm in what you believe is right. Even so, you shouldn't try to force anyone who thinks differently to follow your beliefs. And I do agree with the sentiment, and I do believe that Black Butler does a great job at highlighting a story that is technically morally wrong, you know, since the main theme is bloodthirsty revenge but it still feels like escapism. Black Butler is just another dark work of fiction that's fun to watch 
and may make you question the morals of revenge and what you're willing to sacrifice to attain it. But at the same time, every person having their own sense of justice and what they consider right or wrong also plays into how we as the audience can view Tabasso's works. In the end, the audience gets to determine how learning from Tabasso's previous works and certain views of a portion of the Black Butler fandom influence their decisions to watch. I want to make it clear that I don't think that anyone who watches or reads or enjoys Black Butler should be condemned in any way for doing so. Neither do I think anyone should be condemned for liking Made in Abyss, especially in the wake of the whole K-pop recommendation fiasco. Both of these series are works of fiction that can be enjoyed while also addressing the questionable aspects of their storytelling and characters in the creator's previous works. I enjoy both Made in Abyss and Black Butler, and because I enjoy them I want to make sure I can fully understand and critique them. Art is made to be critiqued and also appreciated. And Black Butler is a stunning testament to this, especially with its audience. So many incredible essays and articles discussing important elements of the story, from the ethics of shipping culture to the complexities of sexuality and gender. For example, I was pleasantly surprised to find so many references to people discussing girls' gender in a positive way. No series, anime or otherwise, is perfect, nor should it be, but we should all be allowed to question and come to our own conclusions about it without having to force those conclusions on others. I want people to use these kinds of videos as starting points for discussions of media, but allows us to think deep about what we watch, if we want to watch them, and to at least respect each other's boundaries. Many new fans might be flocking to Black Butler now that a new season is coming out. I wanted people to know not only how insanely messy the anime adaptation is and how to watch it if they so please, but also be aware of the creator and her history and certain things that are kind of under the surface of the series itself. At the end of the day, I just wanted to do a deep dive on the series because I wanted to determine if it's one hell of a Butler anime or one hell of a hot mess. Or maybe it's a little bit of both. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I encourage you to continue the conversation in the comments down below. If you have to mention a spoiler, please mark it so that people don't, you know, accidentally get spoiled if they do want to watch the series. What was your experience watching Black Butler or are you going to watch Black Butler now that a new season is coming out? Let me know. And in the future, if you want to help support me doing more deep dives on series, by like raising funds so I can buy the manga or other media for a series so I can do a more thorough research on it. Please consider becoming a patron or even buying something on Patreon. I'll leave a link in the pinned comment below. Anywho, beware of butlers that want to devour your soul and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.